There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, once you choose it, you can't lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an ocean twice singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation. It's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. When the valleys that I wander turn to mountains that I can't climb. Oh, you are with me, never leave me. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old fire singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy Clap your hands and stop your feet Till you find that gospel beat Cause it's all you'll ever need All you'll ever need Clap your hands and stop your feet that gospel beat cause it's all you'll ever need oh you'll ever need i've got an old church choir singing in my soul i've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful i've got an old church choir singing in my soul i've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful i've got a heart overflowing been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Oh, joy. The next song we're gonna be doing is Chain Breaker. Anybody who has a testimony this morning, go, go hesitate.
The atmosphere is changing, nothing stays the same. Heaven is waiting for the mention of the name. The spirit is moving, burning like a flame. Healing the broken by the one we proclaim.
thankful today that strong heart holds a broken. <laughs> oh, I'm thankful for his holy, holy name. Amen. I'm, uh, uh, if you didn't notice, we're doing some different stuff. Amen. Chris told me to do it a while ago. We've been working on getting it there, so we did it this morning. Uh, he said, we need to sing more congregationals. We're going to start singing more congregational. He said, uh, that's, he told me, he said, Corey, it's weird when all the, the, half the congregation leaves and then you get up and preach. He said, we need something to kind of break that up. I said, yes, sir, we'll have a song. And uh, not just a song, but a powerful song. Amen. Something that gets us into where we need to be to hear God's word and to apply it to our lives. Amen. So as Brother Chris is sitting, I don't know, he said, I'm going to watch. I, amen. He might be back in AFib because he's all worked up again. The man did sprints in the hallway to, uh, the day after his surgery. Had to go get a tune-up yesterday. Amen. I, I, I was leaving as Miss Shelley was coming. She left. I came. They moved him while I was there, or was getting ready to move him, and I was leaving, and I said, Miss Shelley, he scared me to death. <laughs> and uh, luckily, she showed up, and she's calm. I'm not calm. I, I said, fix him. <laughs> that's what I told the nurse. I said, fix him. Uh, that's my boy. Uh, people don't understand how much I love that man. Uh, I remember when we, uh, we were doing two services, um, and that time in between, uh, the services, me and him would just sit in there and uh, eat some breakfast and just talk. And I'd listen to him. I, I, that's one of my favorite things to do is just to listen. Shelly just gave me the look. Don't You don't need to be listening to him. I love listening to his stories. I don't know which ones are true and which ones aren't. And I ain't asking him, amen. Um, but I enjoy that time of fellowship, and I'll never forget it. It's been wonderful uh, working with him. Uh, I can't wait to get him back. Um, come on. Uh, he, uh, come on, Daniel. Um, we're going to do some other weird stuff around here. We, we're, we're a church where, where young preachers are coming to preach. God is calling them. So we've got to do some things a little bit different to aid to growth. Um, one of the things that has to be done is getting used to the looks that you get. So this is lesson number one. Daniel's going to come read the text this morning. Second Chronicles chapter number 20. He's going to come read a few verses and pray for us. Daniel, you hear me? You're going to read and pray. Um, the other ones are going to, going to be doing that too. But right now they're concentrating. They're stressing out about their first sermons here. Uh, Caleb preached his first one to the, the um, True Freedom. But he's going to preach his first one to the church on July the 5th. And Mike going to be July the 12th. Both of those are Wednesday nights. It's going it's fitting to be lit. <laughs> lit. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Um, I'm excited for it. But uh, put your hands together for my, my, my man, uh, Dan, as he comes and reads God's word for you this morning. And praise. Don't forget to pray. <laughs> Just the verse 12. Verse 12. And it says, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Amnon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side of Syria. And behold, they be the as anon Tamar, which is in, in Getty, yeah, it's close enough. Now he knows why I want him to read. <laughs> <laughs> give, give, giving, me, giving me all the hard words. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat feared and set to himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help for the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God, 
of our fathers. Art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they, they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us, as a sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then out will hear and help. And now, behold, the children of Amnon and Moab <coughs> and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which <coughs> thou hast given us to inherit. O God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we want to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being able to meet in your house, Lord. We ask you that you move throughout this congregation today, Lord, and that you leave no doubt and open our hearts and our minds to, this, to your word, Lord. And we ask this in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Yep. Amen. You say, preacher, what's taking place here? Well, we've got to do a little bit of background for this. What's taking place here in chapter number 20 is um, something that was set in the works in chapter number 7. In Second Chronicles chapter number 7, you find that uh, Solomon is dedicating the temple. He's, he's built it as his dad has instructed him or told him how uh, uh, what he should do based on uh, the movement of the Spirit. And, and, and according to God's plan, he would develop and, and do what he's supposed to do there. And uh, But here, at the after getting all them cedars of Lebanon and all of the, the gold and all of the, the different things that there was um, uh, uh, set up, he prayed a prayer. He said, God, if, uh, if things get a little bit different around here, if we fall, if we move away from you, if we at any time get invaded, if we, if we cease to do uh, 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 or cease to, to walk in the ways of you, if, if God at any time we get broken, if any time we get burdened, if any time we need some kind of help, God, uh, if we turn towards this place, God, will you do something for us? And we find that after he does this, he has a, a dream or something to that effect. And in verse number 14 of that chapter, the Bible says that God answered him. He said, if my people, which are called, y'all heard that? Called by my name, shall humble themselves pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and will heal their land. So what's taking place here is Je uh, Jehoshaphat has uh, discovered uh, in his new reign that things aren't like they're supposed to be. And uh, thing, he's trying his best to get things back on course. And he's trying his best to, 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 to be a king uh, with his mind on God. But, then, uh, but as he's doing this, an opposition comes at him. How many knows that when you're trying your best is when the opposition hits you the hardest? 
When you're just trying to do something right, just trying to make some kind of steps forward, then the opposition comes. And, and, and here the Moabites and the Amorites come. And, and, or, or, or is it Amorites? Let me see here. Make sure I'm right. Yes, Amorites, they come and they, they, they get ready to battle against the children of Israel. And you see there that he uh, sees this battle or these, these men coming and Jehoshaphat says, we, we've got to do something. And his, his mind would go traveling back to the promise that was made to Solomon and he would say, this is that kind of time where the people need to turn back to God, where I need to turn back to God. So in verse number 3 you find he said himself to seek the Lord. That's what it says. He said, I, I am going to seek God with all of my heart. I'm going to, 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 I'm going to, to, to uh, humble myself. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek His, His, His face. I'm going to turn from my wicked ways because I need God to hear me. I need God to turn to me. I need God to look on my situation. And He said, not only I, but I'm going to make every last person in this kingdom Kingdom, turn back to God. He said, I'm going to do the oh Lord. He said, the Bible says this, and Judah gathered themselves together to ask, ask help of the Lord. Even out of all of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. He said, let's all gather up, gather up, and call on the only one who can help us. Wow, that's amazing. So he, he prays. He begins his prayer. And we get down to verse number, uh, 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 verse number 12. He lays it out to God. He gets honest with God all the way up to this point. Listen, may I stop for a minute and fix some things? God doesn't want a prayer of form and fashion. God wants a prayer of honesty. God doesn't want you to grab a bead and talk about it for five seconds. God wants you to grab onto Him and talk about Him for about five seconds. Amen? God doesn't want you to get down and say some prayer that some man wrote 50 years ago to try to get a hold of heaven. He wants you to come out of the sincerity of your heart to his throne to get help. So here this man comes to God with the sincerity of his heart and he cries to him and says this, Oh, oh our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. He said, I have no idea what to do. I wonder, have you ever been in that place? Have you ever found yourself with opposition coming at you? You was trying to do all that you could do to live right, to act right, to do right. Then the opposition comes at you and you found out that you truly did not know what to do. The bank called and said that you owed something. You didn't know what to do. The, the bills came the next morning and you found out that you just didn't have enough to make it through and you didn't know what to do. The ball started getting on to you and you didn't know what to do. Life got hard and you didn't know what to do. You say, preacher, what can I do when I don't know what to do? I'm going to give every... Here's your proposition, boys. I believe this with all of my heart. If every last person into the sound of my voice would take the following <laughs> determined steps in their life. They can see that what the Lord can do when you don't know what to do. You say, what is that preacher? Look at verse number 12. It continues on. He said, he said oh God, what do I do? Because I don't know what to do. He said, I want to do this one thing. He says, but, all right. 
are on thee. Our eyes. What do I do when I don't know what to do? Number one, keep your eyes on the right person. Why, preacher, is it important for me to keep my eyes on the right person? Because where you are looking, that's where you're going. And if you're looking in the wrong, at the wrong thing, you're going to get blindsided. When I was playing high school football, they, did a, they made a mistake and put me on the punt team. Some of you's heard this story. You're going to hear it again. Probably be different. But I was on the punt team. I didn't like the punt team. Our job was to block for a few seconds and then run down and try to tackle somebody. I've been running the whole time. I don't want to run again. I was conserve. I decided I was going to conserve my energy. And I play. They moved me from tackle on punt, on, on uh, from offense over to to, to guard on on the uh, punt team. And my other buddy or my buddy who was we were both fast fat people. There's, there's degree of, of speed and, and fatness, say ma'am. And now we were fast, fat people. So they expected us to block longer and run harder. They was dumb. Didn't happen. We decided we was going to play safety. You say, what's that mean? We was going to safely jog down there and safely let somebody else tackle them. And if they got by them, then we try to knock them down. That was our job. So, I found about halfway through this undetermined spirit that I had that I like to watch stuff. I said, they said, Hut, snapped the ball, the dude kicks it, I, I'm holding my guy. I said, okay, that's been three one thousandths, let's let him go. I let him go, they kicked the ball, and I'm like, man, look how high that ball is. Boom! I was looking at the ball. I didn't know that the opposition was looking at me. Have you ever done that? Got to looking at one thing. The next thing you know, you're getting hit by something else. This morning at about 6.30, I, come, I, I was walking down. I, I brought my stuff, dropped it in the office, and went downstairs. And, and I, was, I seen uh, Mike and Caroline had their door uh, nice and made up. And it was dark in there, and I was squinting my eyes trying to see it real good. And um, Mike left a chair out in the middle of the walkway. I didn't see the chair coming because I was looking at the door. You, mm. I, start, I started walking. and <laughs> Somebody! And here's what your poor, lowly preacher looked like. I thought I pulled both hips out of joint. I was walking funny. I, and I looked up at the camera. And I said, It's dead. Yes. This is not going on YouTube. You see... What you're looking at directly affects <laughs> how you're walking. If I wouldn't have looked at that door, if I wouldn't have looked at that ball, I wouldn't have gotten messed up like I did. And we have a lot of people looking at the wrong things, the wrong people. I wonder how many people is looking at their parents. You want to know how I know that young adults look at their parents? Because they think they got to have what all their parents had in 60 years, the first 30 years of their life. Next thing you know, they got 37 credit cards and all of them are maxed out. Word to you, mama. Y'all know I'm speaking the truth today. We all, listen, we've all been there. We're all trying to get. I, I, I want to live like my mom and dad did because my life was so great. I want to give my kids the life. Listen, let me tell you how to you give your kids the right kind of life like your parents gave you. If you're trying to do that, just love them. That's it. Just love them. 
You see, but we're all looking for somebody else, something else tangible down here. We have a a, a horizontal viewpoint. And as long as we're striving for things down on the horizontal level, we'll always be tripping, we'll always be falling, we'll always be making mistakes because the longer we look down here, the more we look like what it's like to be down here and the more messed up our lives become. But when we get vertical, honey, when we start looking up unto the author and finisher of our faith, the one who died on the cross, who now sits down at the right hand of the Father, when we lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help when we look to him everything changes stop looking at everybody else in your life trying to live like them I wonder is there somebody in your life you've been trying to live like I run into people who try to open businesses so they can be like this person who opened a business and they'll read books about this person who opened a business and they model their life like that person and they, they say, I don't, they'll come to me and they'll, I don't know why my life's a mess. I tried to model everything like this guy and he look how successful he is. You see, what happened was they modeled on a person without seeing the full picture of the person. They only saw what was packaged up for them to see. And modeled their life off of them. I'm thankful that I serve one who is transparent. Who's been where I've been. Who's seen what I've seen. Who struggled like I struggled. And now if I live my life like him. Then I know I will be successful. Let's look on. Let's go on. Not only do it, when you don't know what to do, do you continue to, or you try to keep your eyes on the right person, but I like this one. I got to confess, I didn't get this point from, uh, on my own. Another preacher made this point, and I liked it so much, I evangelistically borrowed it. Amen. Look at verse number 14. What do I do, preacher, when I don't know what to do? Keep your eyes on the right person. Look at Jesus. Number two, the Bible says in verse 14, Then Jehazel, the son of that guy, the son of that guy, and the son of that guy, and the son of that guy, and he was a Levite, the son of Asaph, who was the, the guy who wrote a bunch of psalms. Okay? came to the Spirit of the Lord in the midst. We should bring Daniel back up here and have him repronounce all of those, don't, shouldn't we? He did a good job. Uh, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And here's what he said. Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, Oh, Lord, look at this. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of great multitude, of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You say, what's the next step? What do I, the next thing I need to do, preacher? Uh, not only do you, do, do you need to keep your eyes on the right person, but you need to turn your ears to the right kind of preaching. Yep. I thought I'd get a few more amens. <laughs> Listen, li- uh, good. Mm. we find here that the Bible brings a man who was not scared of the position of uh, the king. He was not afraid of the position of the armies. They, he didn't, they weren't scared of the fact that they had swords and spears. Uh, but he was scared of the one who sat on high. And he said, uh, in reverence to him, will I say, thus saith the Lord. And if you kill me, I don't care. I'm still going to tell you what he told me to tell you. So he gets up there in front of the king. And he says, I want to tell you, king, I know you're go- mm-hmm. I know you're looking at yourself, looking at your army, trying to do all that you can, but this ain't your battle, honey. This is God's battle. You see, he was a preacher who was anointed by God, and he preached the word. You see, what we have to do is listen to the right kind of preaching. 
When I first got called to preach, I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Wonder why. I like to go back and think about those times that I'm scared to death feeling the, my heart in my stomach, doing jumping jacks, getting the glory bumps on me for really no real reason at all. I go, I go, go to Baskin Robbins, watch the lady dip the ice cream out and just go, oh, glory to God. You know what I mean? You don't know why you're so excited. You're just excited about something, about the fact that he even looks at you as if you're worthy to do something for him. And I, I remember I, my preacher told me, I, I said, preacher, how do you know, well, what do you do to preach? Like, how do I preach? He said, well, you heard me do it. He said, well, preach. And then I preached my first sermon, all few minutes of it, a lot of crying, a lot of snotting, it was the best moment. It was awesome. Terrible, but awesome. Nobody, I don't even know if they even understood what I said. I just heard, <laughs> Let's pray. It was bad, Mike. It's bad. No, it won't happen to you. I'm just saying. That's just how I, it's just how it was for me. And, uh, but I, he told me after the service, he said, okay, now I can tell you. I can help you a little bit. He said, some people go to Bible college. Some people go to life. He said, I went to life. That's how I learned how to preach. He said, and then I started, he said, I started listening to as many preachers as I, I could. So I chose to go to life instead of Bible college. There ain't nothing wrong with going to Bible college. Matter of fact, I think, you know, a good, found, sound, fundamental uh, education is good for you. Amen? But not all of us can do that. Some of us, some of us got to work. <clears throat> Amen? So I, I grabbed my Bible, and I'd get in a corner, and I'd read it. And I'd preach to every cricket in the basement of my mom and dad's house. And then I'd go and listen to a preacher preach about what I just wrote or what, what I just read. And then I'd get there. <laughs> you ever do that? Then I'd start preaching like them for a couple weeks. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. I mean, if they was one who told a lot of stories, I went in there and told a lot of stories, had nothing to do with what I was preaching about. <laughs> Trying to make people laugh. Then I get in there, and if I had one of them, I listened to a hellfire and brimstone preacher that week. Oh, I'd get down there with those three or four people that let me preach to them, and I'd get in there, and I'd just, boom, 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 just blowing them up. And the Bible says, ha, hmm, just giving it to them, working them to death. You're going to hell. You've been saved for 45 years. There's only four of you in here, and all of you is going to heaven, but you going to hell. <laughs> I'm sorry. Preacher told me to listen to preaching. You learn how to preach, so I did. <laughs> but I remember going down the road in that little green Subaru legacy, just plopping it along through the foothills of West Virginia. I'd put a new CD on, and I, I'd get in there, and they'd start talking about Jesus. Tears start rolling down my face, and some man I never met before would pour into my life the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he'd tell stories after story after story about how God can save old lost sinners. And I'd sit there, and, and that one would run out, and I'd put another one in. I, I'd grab a little seat or one of those little tapes, and I'd shove it in the hole, and I, I'd sit there until it got a little squirrely, and I'd change it again. I, I'd listen to another preacher. Next thing I know, I'm doing 155 miles an hour on the foothills of West Virginia, tears rolling down my face, and the blue light special behind me. <laughs> they pulled me over. I remember this like it was yesterday. Guy pulled up. He said, what's wrong with you, son? You're doing 145. And I looked up with tears running down my face. 
And I said, I'm hooked up with Jesus. He thought I was hooked up with something else. I said, I, I got to listen, and I turned it up, and, and uh, Larry Brown was getting after it, and he was just throwing down, and I had tears running down my face, and that, that officer looked at me, and I felt, think he fell under conviction. He said, I got to get you out of here before I get saved. And, and Listen, he said, you have a nice day. Find a different preacher because that one's going to make you wreck. said, Preacher, what was you doing? I was just doing anything I could to get around something that was good so that I could learn how to do it too. In this generation, we got a lot of content. Listen to me very clearly. Got a lot of content. If there's anything that 2020 did, listen, I'm going to open your eyes for a minute. It gave us access, more access to preaching. Now, hope, hold up. There's good preaching, and there's other preaching. I might not get to that third point. Are y'all okay with that? Hey, Amen. It wasn't that good anyway. It was good preaching, and then there's that preaching. And now, right now, you can get on Facebook, click on one preacher, and me, he'd be good. And they're like, Algorithm, bing, 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 and they'll find all these little short videos of preachers. And I, I, I'm guilty of this right now. I like to get stuck in the reels. Like you get, get <laughs> I do. I love it. some dad pitching wiffle ball to his son, and bam, you know what happens. And I'll sit there and I'll watch 20 of those in a row, and I just giggle. And then I go out back, and Titus does it to me, and it ain't funny. But I'll get in there and listen to preaching and I'll slide up another one. i slide up another one. Next thing I know, I'm down and deep. And I get to here and I start listening. Some of what's being said in the pulpits of America makes me sick. Because it ain't preaching. It, mm. I just, I'm going to make some people mad. You know, one thing I learned, just because they are, ooh, just because they're on TV doesn't mean God allowed it. So we need to know what, what happened, preacher. What, what do you do? See, I'm not going to get to the third point. And it was good. <clears throat> Y'all said it was, you said it was bad. Well, go ask because I didn't want you to get mad at them. Look, these, these, these reels and these preachers on TV right now, and not all of them. Not all of them, trust me, not all of them. But they're preaching a gospel message that is tailored towards the humanity and not to the Christship and kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, honey, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're putting humanism in the pulpit and said, you're good enough, you're okay, you're going to make it, you just be powerful, you just be strong. Whatever. You say, preacher, how? <clears throat> I'm going to give you three, three good lessons real quick. How do I know I'm listening to the right preacher? By the directives the preacher gives. Three directives that a preacher should give. Number one, he should direct you to the power of God. Verse 15 says, thus saith the Lord unto, the, unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed. By reason of great multitude. For the battle is, the your, is, is not yours. It's God. He said, it's not in your power. It's not in your might. It's in his. So is the preacher preaching a gospel that takes the power out of your hands and puts it back in his hand? Number two, uh, verse 16 says, Tomorrow you'll go down against them. Behold, they'll come up by the cliff of Ziz. And ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerusalem. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Just stand still. Number two, does he give you God's plan? Does he give you God's plan? You see, a lot of times preachers will get in there and give their own plan. Seven steps to success. Y'all ever heard anybody? I'm going to give you seven steps to success. The 
throw the fog machine on. The lights in the house will go down. They'll put a little music in the background. He'll give you seven wonderful steps, and you'll be like, Woo, glory! Ain't nothing to do with Jesus or his plan. What's his plan? He already started it. His plan was to come down and live sinless. Yeah, amen. His plan was to get on the cross for sin-filled people. His plan was to die and conquer death, hell, and the grave and to stand up again on the third day and, and then, whoo, glory, and, and then save you. That's the plan. And then he also has provisions. The Bible says this he, 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 in verse 17. He says, And ye shall not need to fight in, in this uh, uh, battle. Set yourselves and stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord on you, uh, with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. If the preacher's telling you that you can do it all by yourself, he's wrong. If he's telling you that you, you, you have the ability to to stand on your own, you're wrong. It, 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 man, uh, listen, I'm here to tell you this. If the preacher doesn't tell you that the only way to stand today is standing with Jesus, standing for Jesus, and standing in Jesus, then that preacher needs to find a new pulpit because he ain't preaching here. Amen. Sorry, but it felt good to say that. Oh, I got some minutes. I got some minutes. Let me give you this last thing, okay? This last thing. Number three. Jehoshaphat bowed his head after hearing all of this to the ground. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord and worshipped the Lord. Not after, oh, right after this, his reaction to the good news, you see something awesome. He said, I heard that God was going to fight for me. And I want, to, I want you to see this. Many of us sit in pews where preachers tell us that God will fight for us. All to go out the next minute and pick up their own sword. Not Jehoshaphat. When he heard that God was going to fight for him, he fell down on his face and said, Thank you, God. And not only did he do that, go down to verse 21 and 22. The Bible says, And when they had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord and should, uh, uh, that should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went to say uh, uh, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever and when they had begun to sing and to praise the Lord set ambushment against the children of Ammon and Moab and, and Mount Seir uh, which were come against Judah and they were smitten you say preacher what did he do he said we can't let the praise stop here because the battle's coming he said I mm, I need to set some people in motion because our actions show our attitude to God. Ooh, drop that back. Our actions show our attitude to God. God, you said you'd fight for me. So we ain't going out there with swords. We're going out with trumpets. We're going out with praise. And we're going to glorify your name. I found this to be something amazing. But every time I've been around somebody who's went through a real trial and they've chose to praise God through it, they've never not made it through. It may have not looked like they wanted to look in the end. See, I think that's sometimes where we fail at. We have a preconceived notion of how we want it to go, and we try to twist God's arm into making it about us. 
But everything is ultimately for his glory. So it's not going to turn out the way that you want it to. No matter how you pray, no matter how you claim it, it's going to turn out for him. It's how he's going to get the most praise out of it. So you want to help, you want to help, the, you want to help the situation? Praise in the situation. And the Bible says that they got, I, I can't remember the word, ambushment. Ambushment. Is that it? I don't know what that means. I just, listen, when I, was, when I was playing war in the backyard with my brother, I'd ambushment him all the time. I'd get up on the roof and I'd see him walk by and I'd jump down with my gun and boom, 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 boom. Scared that baby to death. Ambushment. What happened was they got to singing. And this group over here got to wondering what was going on. And this group over here got to wondering what was going on. Next thing you know, they were fighting each other. And the children of Israel were walking out going body counts of everybody else who was following because they were ambushment to the because they praised God in the middle of the, the problem. Man, that's tough stuff, isn't it? See, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we don't know what to do. We don't. I'll be straight honest with you. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we listen to the right kind of people. Mm -hmm. And we start saying the right kind of praise. Next thing you know, God will start supplying the right kind of provision. Help us make it through. I don't know who you are today. I don't know what's going on. Everybody in here might be the happiest people on the planet. There may be nothing up against you. Or you might be like me. Or thought everything was fun. Everything was doing great. I was having a great time watching these young preachers squirm. <laughs> Watching people get saved, and then watching it turned into watching my people's hurting. They, they don't teach you that in Bible college. They don't teach you that in anything else but real life. And I'll be honest. The last couple of weeks ain't been that fun to be a preacher. A lot of texting, a lot of praying, a lot of missing texts because you're praying. A lot of organizing or just texting Tracy and she's already got it done. What a blessing. Text Miss Vaughn, hey, we need to get flat. They're already done, already on their way. But I'm going to be honest. Last week I found myself not knowing what to do. Straight. And I just decided that I'm going to do everything I know to do. That was to look to Jesus. Stay consistent. And, let, and praise him through it all. And I don't know who you are and what you're going through. You might be perfect. It's fine. But there's some people in here. Y'all going through some stuff. Well, what, what do I do, preacher? Listen to this preacher as he tells you. Look to Jesus. Praise his holy name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. What do I do? When I'm confused, when my life's in chaos, when I'm unsure, when I just don't know what to do, preacher, the best thing we can all do is just look to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never accepted him as your personal Savior, I want to ask you, what are you waiting on? I'm sure your life isn't wonderful, but in him it could be. 
If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I want to give my I want to lift my hand and give testimony to the fact that Jesus is my Savior. I've called on him as my king. Here's my hand. We here's my hand. Maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, I want to raise my hand and say, I don't know if I've ever been saved. I don't know if I've ever called on Jesus as my king, but I want to raise my hand and ask you to pray for me. I'm not going to come back to where you are. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. I see that hand. Anyone else? Maybe you're here today and you say this, preacher. Sometimes I just don't know what to do. Will you pray for me that I just look to Jesus, listen to the right people, and listen to the right plan of sticking with Jesus, praying to him. him. Here's my hand. Amen. I see those. Oh, praise God. Praise God. We already got one on the altar. I want to invite you to come. Wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing in your life, I wonder if you come today, call on Jesus. This one's come. How about you? I'm calling on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. I'm looking to Him because there ain't nowhere else worth looking. How about you? Maybe you're here today and you're guilty of listening to the wrong thing and sending you in the wrong direction. Maybe it's time to turn back to Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, we all make mistakes. We all mess up. But it's at the point where we don't look back to Jesus is when we make the worst mistake. today and you're one of those people who raised their hand and said they're, they don't know if they've ever been saved, wouldn't it be nice to leave here knowing? Wouldn't it be nice to leave here knowing? You say, preacher, how do I know? How do I know? We call on Jesus. I want to invite you to step out of your seat, come down to this altar and let me pray with you. Let me help you know that you've given your heart to Jesus. I'd love to do that with you. take one step. That's the hardest. The rest of them are easy. Won't you come? Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word and what it means to us. God, I pray that it was a challenging word. I, th- I pray that it was a shaking word. I pray that it was a shaping word. I pray that it was a helpful word today. God, and I know that it is because you wrote it. And if we did it the right way, then it, it was helpful. We did it the wrong way. We just hurt some people. I pray that we always do it the right way. Lord, I pray that you take your word and use it for your glory always. Help us as we leave this place that we come back safely to me again. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just a couple of reminders. Tonight will be the last Sunday night service of the... uh, uh, of the summer until September, um, we're going to be moving to connect groups. Uh, they'll meet at different times. Uh, some may meet later in the day on Sunday. Some may l- meet earlier in the day on Sundays. There's right now there's two, two to three groups um, that are meeting, 
and we'll tell you the time and the topic. Because uh, this one, you might be with them one day, and they, you hear a topic that you want to hear about over here, and you decide, hey, I'm going to go to this one this week, and they ain't good, nobody's going to be mad at you. Uh, because we want you to grow and learn this summer. and Or this one may be meeting at 7 this week, and you decided that you can't make it to 7, but you can make it to a 5 o'clock one or something like that. Um, as long as you're getting something, that's what we want to see and hear. Uh, we do want to make sure that you know about America Sunday. It's next week. Uh, the 4th of July is not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. So that's the Sunday right before the 4th of July. And we, we planned so hard for this event. As I said, hey, let's just wear America colors next week. That was the plan. So, you know, red, white, and blue. The, the more red, white, and blue in this building, the better. Amen. America, I hope, I hope those commies turn on our channel and see all that red, white, and blue and get scared. Hey, ma'am, I mean, are you still allowed to say commies? No, no, that's all right. Can in here because we're Americans. Uh, then uh, don't forget about the vacation Bible school meeting at five fifteen. Be here, learn what it's about, volunteer. You it, you say, well, they don't have no spot for me. I promise you, we'll find you a spot. Hey, ma'am. If we have seven different people handing out cookies, we'll be all right. We'll find you a place to serve, uh, even if you're just standing around helping kids walk to the right classroom. That's a good spot for you. Um, we have True Freedom tomorrow, uh, Bible study tomorrow, right? Eight o'clock still. Uh, ladies are next week. All right, I, I'm, look at this. I'm going to get good at this. I am going to get good at this. See, see uh, Mike and Caroline about $5 stickers for your cars or anything else you'd like to stick it on there. Would they do good on the back of uh, signs in Canal City? Uh, that's not me. That wasn't me. Uh, don't forget about the food baskets. And, uh, men's bringing uh, soup. I spelled it soap, I think, right there. Uh, we're bringing soup. And the ladies, a dollar for one more week, and it switches over next week. Um, I believe that's all the announcements that I'm going to make. Uh, tonight, we'll be back, 6 o'clock. Brother Daniel is going to preach on the lions then. This is his last one before we break, and then we'll come back, and he'll get into prophecy, and it'll get... If you thought it was deep before, it's going to get, you put your waders on, it's going to be fun. Um, but he's going he's to bring a real lion in here, <laughs> and he's going to wrestle it in the name of the Lord. So bring a friend with you to see Daniel wrestle a lion tonight. Wouldn't that be awesome? I'm going to stand in my office. I'll, I'll cut a hole in the wind. And, but, I'm scared. Um, I could talk all day to you guys because I love you, but I'm hungry. And I ordered Olive Garden in my office a while ago. By the time I get there, it'll be done. So, Andrew, will you pray for us?